I could have titled this message uh, a couple different things. I'm actually not much of a title person. I probably would not have titles to my messages, but when you put them online, you have to have a title. So I could have said that this uh, message this week and next week would be called uh, What God Expects in the Church, uh, because here in Philippians chapter 1, he clearly delineates what he expects of his people, Paul as he's writing. Uh, I also could have titled it A Life Worthy of the Gospel because of what it says in verse 27, and we'll focus on that for a bit this morning. But I decided to title it Paul's Plea to the Church because there are three clear things here in this portion of Philippians chapter 1, and we'll talk about one of those this morning. Now, before we get to the one, I want to kind of give you a little bit of the context because it's incredibly important to what we'll talk about today and then next week. And so if you see in verse 27, the beginning portion, it says, whatever happens, conduct. Everybody say that word. Conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. So Paul's writing this letter, and he's sending it out to the church, and he's sending it out to the leaders. And from prison, he's writing, and he's saying, whatever happens, conduct yourselves worthy of the gospel of Christ. Now, this wording is a comprehensive kind of wording. It's talking about the totality of our lives or our total manner of life, the whole life, our entire life is to be lived as a life worthy of the gospel of Christ. Now, I'm not much of a Greek or Hebrew scholar. Pastor Jonathan Schrock is, okay? But in in the original language, this word conduct, there was in the Bible times a word that is not used here when it talks about walking, and, and as Paul is writing and he's saying, whatever happens, conduct yourselves or walk this thing out in life. There was a, a word that was used all throughout scripture as it talked about our walk or our living. But Paul, as he's writing this, it's very interesting that he doesn't use the word that you would think he would use in the original Greek language. He uses a different word and it's only referenced twice in scripture. And it's very important because as we're going to talk about this, the word that he's using as he's saying, whatever happens, conduct yourselves or kind of walk out this salvation in a way, in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. There is a reason why he's using this particular word. Now, you need to remember this is a letter that's being sent to Philippi, right? And Philippi was a proud Roman colony. In fact, it was like a miniature Rome. And a city became a Roman colony by one of two ways. So this is the context of why he's saying it this way. And so one of the ways was what would happen is a veteran soldier that was ready for retirement was usually granted citizenship if they would go out and settle these colonies. And what would happen was later on, a city would be granted the distinctive title uh, or of a Roman colony for the loyalty and the service to the emperor. And so it was very distinctive of these, these colonies like Philippi, and they had a very fanatic loyalty to Rome. The citizens kept all of their Roman ties. They kept the original language. They kept the customs, the affairs, the dress, the titles. And they, they didn't allow or they refused to allow any infiltration or any local influence whatsoever. And so these colonies, what they would do is they would totally reject the influence of the outside world around them. They were Roman colonists in an alien environment. You have to see this because this is the context of what Paul is going to plead to these believers because these believers, they, they were Roman colonists in an alien in environment. And so this word that he's using is he's talking about whatever happens, conduct yourselves. The actual wording is a wording that is associated with citizenship. He's saying you're supposed to act like a kingdom citizen. Now, 
we really value in this nation being an American. But you're a citizen of heaven first, and you're an American secondly. And there are things that you're going to read in, in the word of God that may not necessarily line up with the things of American culture. So Paul, as he's writing, and he's going to plead to these people, he's saying, live a life, conduct your life in a way that you're a citizen of heaven first. He's saying, keep close ties with heaven. He's saying, speak the language of heaven, bear the title of heaven, bear witness to the customs of heaven, carry on the affairs of heaven, act like a citizen of heaven, don't allow the infiltration of the worldly influence to impact your life in, in any way, shape, or form. You're to conduct yourselves at a, as a citizen of another realm. And so the wording that he's using is so critically important because as they read this, they were like, that's exactly what our colony's like. Everything else around us can be different, but we're not going to allow the culture to penetrate the influence of Philippi. It's very obvious that our world is increasingly post-Christian, right? If you don't believe it, just wake up and step out of your house, right? And, and we're going to continue to see that. We're going to continue to see the need for us to operate and to think and to speak and to live in a, in a kingdom way because many times what, what happened, and some of you that are, that are older than me, being an American and being a Christian used to be kind of similar. And unfortunately, those days are, are, are long gone. And so just because you're an American doesn't mean, you know, I, you know it's interesting, like people... You're not going to find anybody in State College today where years ago, people woke up and they went to church because that's what you do. Those days are over, right? Nobody's waking up in State College this morning and saying, hey, you know what? I think I should go to church today. I think I should read a Bible, right? So we live in a, in a post-Christian culture. And you have to see it that way if you're going to be a citizen of heaven and to begin to think differently. And so Paul, he's writing and he's saying, let the totality or the matter of your life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. And so he's going to plead with the church and he's going to focus on three things. Number one, he's going to focus and he's going to plead for them to stand. We'll talk about that for a minute. Next week, he's going to, you'll hear about how he pleads to them to strive. You're like, I didn't, I didn't think I was supposed to strive in my relationship. We'll talk about that next week. And the one that you're all excited to hear about next week, we'll talk about as he pleads to them su to suffer. You know, we don't hear a whole lot about suffering for the sake of the gospel. But we were just in a, in a conference where there were brothers and sisters in Christ from Middle Eastern nations that they know what it, it is like to be called to suffer. One of the guys that was there said, he said, tens of thousands of Christian homes are being burnt to the ground and nobody hears about it. Another one of the pastors was released after 10 or 13 years of being in prison for the sake of the gospel. He started a church and now it's over 10,000 people. We don't know what suffering looks like, but Paul talks about it in this portion of scripture. So you'll be excited to hear about that next week right? <laughs> but until then, uh, just number one, a plead to stand, a plead to stand. Look at what he says. He says, then whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you will stand firm in one spirit. As he's talking here about the word stand firm, I want you to think of the offensive line of a football team. We have a lot of the guys that are part of the offensive line when they're not in season or are part of our church along with one of the coaches. They know what it's like to stand firm. Picture an offensive line, right? What do they do? This is an oversimplification. I'll probably offend them if they're listening. What do they do? They just stand there. And they work really hard at standing there. 
and they lift a lot of weights so that they can stand there and they watch everything that they eat so they can stand there. Can you imagine like you, you, you're so, just stand, right? You're like, you definitely sound like you're not a football player, Zach, right? I'm not a football player. I'm sure it's way more complicated than just standing. But you know what? If somebody gets by you, you've dropped the ball, right? And so the idea of Paul here, he's using this imagery and he's saying to stand. Everybody say stand. stand. All right? And so it's actually a military word that he's using here. And he's, he's using the wording that he's saying, like the determination of a soldier, hold your ground. Don't budge. Get your feet planted in the soil of the things of the kingdom and don't back down. Don't drift to the left. Don't drift to the right. And certainly don't retreat and don't allow anything to push you back. The idea is he's saying this is to be for us. He's pleading with them. He's saying this is to po- supposed to be a fixed position in the life of a Christian. In life, there are, there's spiritual warfare, Right? In life, there is a struggle. If you, if you don't agree with that, read Ephesians, okay? It's in the Bible for a reason. Life is a battlefield. Life is a spiritual war. Life is a struggle, and you're to fight. You're to hold your ground. Unfortunately, a lot of Christians frolic, and they don't know how to fight, right? There, you, you have to be a fighter as a Christian. You have to be some, not fighting with people. I'm talking about standing your ground. Life isn't a stroll. Life is more of a struggle as a Christian. And you're to stand. Everybody say stand. Stand. You're not supposed to be a weak Christian. You're not supposed to get pushed around and slapped around in life. God has given you the grace. And Paul pleads with the church. He says that they are to stand what? Stand firm. If you don't stand for something You'll fall for just about anything. And as a parent, the world will slap your kids around if you don't teach them to stand for something. Way more than just go to kids' church. No, they need to be rooted in the Bible. They need to be able to stand in the Word. They need to understand why they believe what they believe. They need to understand that there are things like absolute truth. The 25 other people in a classroom can say, well, I don't think... But they can stand, and they are principled type of people. And I just want to ask you that question. Do you stand at work with people that are immoral, may try to get you to do something to compromise your conviction? Do you have the ability to stand and stand strong? If you're a teenager, do you have the ability, when everybody else is doing one thing, to say, God never called me to be like everybody else, and I'm not going to try to live like everybody else. I'll stand. It may cost me. It may, at times, cause you to not necessarily be promoted. But you have the ability to stand firm by God's grace as he empowers you by the Holy Spirit. You are to be a person that can stand. Now, the people of God in Philippi had conquered some ground. They had won some victories. God's saying to them, he's saying, hold on to the victories that you've won. Sometimes it's, it's easier to conquer new ground than to stand on the ground that you've already conquered. You find this with people that struggle with temptation or addiction. And they can get free in a particular area, but sometimes it's very difficult to stay free, to stand your ground, to hold your ground. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11 says, put on the whole armor of God so that you may be able to stand. Ephesians six thirteen, take unto you the whole armor of God so that you will be able to withstand the day of evil. Verse 14, stand therefore. Over and over and over, the Bible calls you and I, to be people that stand. I think it breaks the heart of God to see Christians that waver. And it certainly would break his heart to see Christians that are defeated. So the two ideas here that I want you to see, number one is there's a constant pressure that's exerted against you to cause you to want to retreat. 
That pressure is going to be at home if you live with an unbeliever. That pressure is going to be at work. There's a constant pressure in life that if you're not standing, if you don't guard against it, there's a constant pressure that's exerted against you to try to get you to retreat. And the enemy knows this. And so if he can get the church to retreat, if he can get the Christian to back down, then ultimately, ultimately he wins. And so we're to stand firm. And how do you stand firm? You stand firm in prayer, right? You have to stand firm in prayer. It's one of the ways that we try really hard to emphasize prayer here at the church because you can stand your ground on your knees and never quit. It's why we pray the first Sunday of every month. It's why men and women pray throughout the week. You have to be someone that can stand firm. Stand firm in prayer. You have to stand firm when it comes to representing Christ in our world today. It's interesting. Our culture actually really doesn't have a problem with the church. Our culture doesn't have a problem with Christians as long as they keep their mouth closed. As long as you do what you do in the context of this room, as long as you keep your faith to yourself and personalize it, but unfortunately, it's anti-Bible to keep your faith to yourself. It's not Christianity to keep your faith to yourself. The Bible actually says the exact opposite, so you cannot keep your faith to yourself. It's anti-scriptural just to focus on what God does in this room and who gives a holy hoot what takes place in the world, right? And so the world is actually not anti-church, anti-Christian. It's anti-church and anti-Christian if you try to impose your beliefs on other people or live your faith out in, in the marketplace. But that's the Bible way. Amen? And I'm not saying you have to go into work with an attitude. You don't have to be a jerk. But you can't keep your faith to yourself and you have to stand your ground when it comes to representing Christ in this world. You know, as Paul is talking here about standing firm, I think one of the important things as well for the local church is to stand firm in the mission of what God has called us to do. You know, why do we do what we do here? You know, if you came to church and Somebody were to come up to me, let's say, and they were an unbeliever. Someone was like a brand new Christian. They're like, why does that, like, what's Access Church about? I would say what we have said from the very beginning. We exist to help people. I'm just messing. (laughs) Could you imagine? (laughs) We exist. Some of you are like, oh my gosh, what a bum. It's really simple. We exist to help people become fully devoted followers of Jesus. Where'd you come up with that? The Bible. We exist to help people become fully devoted followers of Jesus. That means there are people in this room that you're saved and you're growing in your relationship with Christ, right? That means there are people in this room that are not saved and you should come into relationship with Christ. If there's nobody in this room that's unsaved, then as a church, we've missed the mark, at least for this Sunday morning, because somebody should be coming to Christ every time we gather. Because we exist to help people become fully devoted followers of Christ. So we have to stand firm when it comes to the mission of what God has called us to do. And methods are going to change. Oh no, what are we doing differently? Nothing right now that I can think of. But I heard somebody once say, you marry the mission, you date the method. Churches that marry the method eventually grow old and die. You marry the mission, God will always call us to help people become fully devoted followers of Christ. If we do anything in this church and it doesn't fit with that statement, we've missed the mark because that's why we do what we do. But the methods are going to change. We started hybrid. That's a method. Mark's launched Go Reentry. That's a method. There will be other ministries down the road because you marry the mission and you date the method. Methods change over time, and that's good 
to do. And so you have to stand firm in the vision of what God has called us to do. You're like, well, I don't, I don't think that's what God has called me to do. Then honestly, I love you. Find another church that does something different. Because what we do is we help people become fully devoted followers of Christ. Now, the word become is a hard word. Because I wish that was a cookie cutter clean word. But you know what? A lot of people are in the process of becoming like Christ. And you know what? You can't expect them to act like Christ in the process of becoming. And unfortunately, a lot of churches are filled with people that, man, they just want picture perfect Christians. But you can't help people become fully devoted followers of Christ if you're not having grace for those who are becoming, right? And so, you know, we have to stand firm when it comes to the vision of what God has called us to do. And I also think we need to stand firm in learning to trust that God will continue to provide all of our needs. I'll tell you what, God has been so good to us. So, so, so good to us. And I wrote down here, and you can just write this if you're taking notes, where God guides, God provides. He pays for what he orders. Or I would say it this way, God's work done God's way is never without God's provision. Anytime God has called us to do something, he has given us the grace and the resources to be able to do it, right? He pays for what he authorizes. And so we have to stand firm in trusting that God will provide. He'll provide for you personally. He'll provide and take care of the needs of this church. He always does. There are things that you need to do. It's not necessarily a blanket statement. There are things that you need to do, like giving. And the Bible says when you do that, he opens up the windows of heaven. He rebukes the devourer. And there are things, there are practical things in the word, but this isn't necessarily a, a teaching on giving. But I don't care how ridiculous it looks like to somebody in the natural, we stand firm and trust that God will take care of, of our needs. Amen? Has that been true to you personally? It's been true to us. I remember from the very beginning of Access Church when, when God had called us to start Access, going to, to Toff Trees with no people, no bank account, no money, and renting Toff Trees. And the lady said to us, she's like, well, where's the money coming from? I was like, well... Ashley, you got the checkbook. We just wrote a check, you know? It's like God will take care of you, and he, and he always does. But you have to stand firm. Paul's pleading to the church to stand firm. Don't turn back. And then there's also this inner tendency to give up. There's this inner tendency to give up, and we battle at times the flesh. Have you, have you noticed that before? Where maybe you're not as enthusiastic as you used to be. Maybe your zeal grows, grows a little lukewarm. Perhaps you used to have a passion for reaching people, and for whatever reason you don't have that passion. It's, it's, it's easier not to pray than to pray, right? It's easier not to share your faith than to share your faith. It's easier not to go in when it comes to discipleship and, and things like that. And so we have to stand fast in one spirit. Those are key words, in, in one spirit. The idea here, as he's writing this letter to the church, he's saying that they're to be in one spirit, and they're to have a spirit of unity. One of the things that I love about our church is our church is incredibly unified. I pray we never lose that. Anytime I'm around other pastors, I walk away with just the appreciation in my heart for how non-cranky people here are. <laughs> like, you, you don't make mountains out of molehills. You, you, you understand God has called us to something, and we're going to have the grace for each other, right? And so the idea is one spirit, one heart, one purpose. We, we focus on, on what matters most, and that should be a powerful testimony in our society, where many churches are divided, families are divided, nations are divided, people are nitpicky, and it's like the news is just trying to get you to hate somebody. That's the world we live in. And I think the church should be the place where people can come and see rich, poor, all kinds of diversity, influential, and just, just 
People that are unified, though. It should be a miracle. Jesus said, they'll know. They're more, they're, you're my disciples because you love one another. And I, I, I wrote this down, and then we'll pray. Unity is not uniformity. It's the celebration of diversity. I'm not like you, and you're not like me, and I don't want you to be like me, and I don't want to be like you. <laughs> Unity is not uniformity. It's the celebration of diversity, and I'm not talking about weird, like, compromising Christianity diversity type of stuff. I'm talking about who you are as a person. My pastor growing up, Pastor Grable, used to say, you are uniquely you, made in the image of God. You're no more the image of God than anybody else. And he said, when you understand that, it'll free you to be kind of who you are in Christ. Because I'm not trying to be you. I don't want you to try to be me. Unity is not uniformity. It's the celebration of diversity. And one of the things that I absolutely love is to see here at the church people that are incredibly diverse and you find your niche. I'm not trying to get you to open the program right now and volunteer. <laughs> what I am trying to get you to do is to search your heart and say, God, if you've called us to help people become fully devoted followers of Christ, what part do I play in that mission? How do I fit? How am I gifted? What are you calling me to do? Because next week we're going to talk about the plead for striving because the idea is not just, you know, the offensive line standing your ground. The next word that he starts using, he talks about, I'm going into my message next week, so I'll, I'll stop in like 30 seconds. The next message, the part of it is he's talking about like, what's the guy on the end of the defensive line going after the quarterback again? Defensive end. That's the imagery. Were you defensive end? High school, yeah. Defensive end, I want you to think of that guy attacking the quarterback. The idea is that we're striving together too. That there's something, not, not for approval in your relationship with God, but God has called you to do something. You're not saved by works, but when you get saved, man, God's got something for you to do and you need to get to work. And you see how ministry flourishes when everybody identifies the part that they play and then they get to work. And we see how beautiful of a picture of the church becomes. Amen? Amen? So until next week, I want you to stand, and we're going to pray for you guys, all right? Aaron's going to come and just play in the background. I want you to grab the hand of somebody next to you. Yeah, come on up. Because what I love here about the church is that, you know what, we're unified. I never sense disunity here. I want to pray that the Lord protects that. I also love that so many of you, you work together for the mission. We're not begging you to work. We, we see so many of you. If you serve in some way, shape, or form at Access Church, raise your hand. Just raise your hand. See, look at all. Most churches, it's 20% of the people do 80% of the work. We're probably 80% of the people. And that's, that's incredible. I never want to lose that. And uh, you are uniquely you. Look at the person next to you. Say, you are uniquely you. You are uniquely you. Don't try to be like them. Be who God called you to be. Amen? Amen. Let's just pray. Father, we come to you today. I just thank you, Lord. We are so thankful for every person that's here in the room. I thank you, Lord, for the spirit of unity here at the church. Father, I thank you that we are gifted, fearfully and wonderfully made from the very foundation of our lives. You created, you knit us together in our mother's womb. God, you've gifted people with talents and abilities, skill sets. You've given each of us different passions. God, you've called us to help people become fully devoted followers of Christ. Our world is, is lost, Lord. And Father, you birthed the church. You're growing a church. Father, I thank you that our, always, our church will always move forward and upward. God, you have a plan for great growth as we continue to put you first. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Holy Spirit. We just acknowledge your presence today. You are so good. So good. 
Father, we just take time right now. Father, unite our hearts together. Thank you, Lord, that our lives would be conducted in a way that are worthy of the gospel of Christ. Father, I pray that when people see us, that they will see that we are people of integrity, that what we believe is how we live, that we're willing to stand firm, willing to count the cost, we're willing to represent you with our lives. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Lord, I thank you you for your word. In John 17, where Jesus was about to go to the cross and He prays for himself, and he prays for his disciples, and he prays for all future believers. And he says the words, make them one in you as I am one in you, Father. Lord, we know that the only unifying force among us is the Holy Spirit within us. And so, Father, I think that as we walk in step with your Spirit, God, that this body stays strong. This body stays unified. God, there is no weapon formed against this body in the way of divisiveness that will prosper in Jesus' name. And every tongue that rises against us shall be condemned. Father, I thank you for these people. I thank you for the ability to stand firm by and through the power of the Holy Spirit. I want to read something that I wrote two years ago, and it's entitled Stand Firm. And the Holy Spirit brought it back to my mind as soon as Zach started talking. You can keep your eyes closed while I read it. It says, stand firm. 2 Corinthians 1, 21 and 22 says, Now it is God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. He anointed us, set his seal of ownership on us, and put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. How do we as believers and ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ stand firm in the midst of suffering, accusation, great trials, uncertainty, and those seasons gripped with fear and added stress? We must start by humbly acknowledging who it is that makes us stand firm. It is not in and of ourselves that we can do anything. The verse above says it is God who makes us stand firm in Christ. Paul goes on to give three vitally important truths that we should take ownership of. First, we are anointed sons and daughters of the Most High God. The idea behind anointed is that we are prepared and empowered for service, commissioned to be his representative. Stand firm in the anointing that you have been given. Secondly, he has set his seal of ownership on us. In the ancient world, a seal was used to identify and to protect. If something was sealed by the king's insignia, everyone knew who it belonged to, and the seal prevented anyone else from tampering with the item. The Holy Spirit is upon us to identify and protect us. Stand firm in knowing whose you are. Finally, Paul tells us that the Holy Spirit is put in our hearts as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. The word guarantee is the word for a down payment. We have been given the Holy Spirit as a down payment for the fullness of what God will do. The Holy Spirit is a pledge of greater things to come. God has purchased us by what Jesus did for us on the cross and has given us an impressive down payment. He won't walk away from the final payment because he has so much invested already. Stand firm in the power of the Holy Spirit who guides you into all truth no matter the season. A later verse in the same portion of scripture says it is by faith that we stand firm. Trust that his promises to you are yes and amen. Stand firm by faith through God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You know, Paul writes in Galatians, he says, don't grow weary in good doing. For in due season you shall reap if you don't lose heart. But then when he writes to the people of Corinth, he changes that a little bit. And he says, we will not lose heart. So it went from if you don't lose heart to we will not lose heart. 
You know, Paul said, don't drift away from the assurance that you receive when you first heard the good news, right? That you are loved, that you are fearfully and wonderfully made, that you are forgiven, that you are reconciled and righteous, that you are justified and sanctified, set free, holy and blameless. And that list goes on and on and on. Don't drift away from that. Stand firmly in who Christ says that you are. And so, Lord, I pray right now that every single one of us would stand firm in the truths that you accomplished when you were nailed to the cross and your blood was shed for us, Lord, and you rose from the dead so that we may walk in righteousness and we may walk free. We may walk justified and sanctified, holy and blameless. Lord, we thank you for what you have done for us and we stand in it this morning and we stand in it this evening and we stand in it tomorrow and as the weeks and the months and the days go on lord and we thank you god that you didn't leave us to figure it out on our own but you gave us your spirit that we may stand in these things and walk in these things lord god i pray that everybody in this room would be encouraged as they leave this morning that their heart would be strengthened this morning god as they leave this place today god and go throughout the week lord and go to their families and go to their workplace lord god Thank you, Lord. God, we thank you, Lord, that you tell us to stand because you have enabled us and strengthened us to be able to stand, Lord God. Thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank we thank you, you God. Lord. Thank you, Lord. We're going to close by having our leaders. They're going to make themselves available to pray. If you're here today and you're sick in body or you're struggling, sometimes you can hear us talk about standing, and sometimes God will help you stand by putting another person side by side that'll hold your arms up and strengthen you and pray with you. If you want someone to pray with you, we'd love the opportunity to do that. If you don't know the Lord, we'd love the opportunity to lead you to Christ and pray for you today. You're one prayer away from a totally different life in Christ. Amen.